Now, uh, you might think that uh, the Middle East, the cradle of civilization, the Fertile Crescent, you know, this is where everything happened. This is where all these fermented beverages were discovered. And then I went to China, and this was uh, back around 2000 again, and I got a completely different picture of where human culture, you know, could have developed and did develop and how fermented beverages could be produced, uh, particularly at a Neolithic site in, um, along the Yellow River, which is called Jiahu. This goes back to about 7,000 BC. And there they were making uh, another kind of beverage, not so dissimilar from the Midas touch, that I'll, I'll describe shortly, uh, this beverage in China, uh, and, and, and then putting it in the graves with the ancestors and also probably having other kinds of celebrations uh, among the living. And so we focused in on these uh, vessels and pottery vessels are really the key to identifying these ancient beverages because the pottery has pores in it and it will absorb liquid and then hold the liquid in the silicate structure of the pottery so that when we come along thousands of years later, we can pull out these marker compounds and determine what the original ingredients were. But this is uh, pottery dated around 7,000 BC. They had not even invented pottery in the Middle East. Or, you know, it's right near the, possibly the beginning, you know, of pottery making in the Middle East. But in China, we have examples going back to 13,000 BC. So here's, here's, a, here's a civilization that many of us know very little about, and yet they're producing pottery, you know, much, much earlier than the Near East. And these are also very well-proportioned uh, vessels, as you see, and they were intended for liquids because of these high uh, necks with the, the splaying mouth and, you know, different kinds of handles and so forth. But it's a narrow-mouthed uh, vessel that would have been intended for a liquid. <laughs> So when I went on this trip uh, the first time through China, which was quite an experience because um, I had another archaeologist from China who insisted that I go to all the major sites. And they, China has a drinking culture uh, a little bit like Georgia. If anybody here has been to, not, not Georgia, not Georgia down in the United States, Georgia up in the Caucasus, where everything centers around wine. Well, in the case of China, it all centers around rice wine or millet wine, and they have um, a lot of toasting that goes on. And, uh, you know, I was for six weeks, almost every day, I was like the guest of honor at a dinner in which I was expected to drink lots of beverage. And I would say, well, you know, I'm more interested in the historical aspects of this. Uh, you know, like a rice wine, uh, you know, not such a high alcoholic content rice wine would be preferable to what they call baijo, which is like 50% alcohol, because I mean that'll just knock you out, and uh, I, I couldn't do that. And then they would, you know, go through their collections and, and arrange for me to take samples back to the U.S. And so we got bases of these vessels, had very little trouble getting it back through customs, and you know we've been able to do a lot of work on it as a result. Now, it turned out, according to the chemical analysis, that this is a mixture of rice, not barley, because rice is native to China, but barley to the Middle East. And then the fruit, um, again, we detected a high level of tartaric acid, which could indicate grape, because China has uh, more species of grape than anywhere in the world. And or the other possibility for China is hawthorn fruit. Now, there's different species of hawthorn fruit. The, the species in the Middle East does not have a high uh, tartaric acid, but the one in China does. And in fact, it has four times the amount of grapes. Um, and so we didn't know for sure then what the, the source of the tartaric acid was. It could be hawthorn fruit or, or grape. And there are some very you know, high sugar grapes in China that they might have used. And then honey which is the highest concentration of sugar in nature. So honey enters into a lot of these formulations. Um, and there were a lot of questions then. You know, this is the earliest use of grape in any alcoholic beverage uh, that's been, uh, or, or hawthorn fruit. Now, um, the uh, Chinese archaeologists have begun doing 
uh, sorting out of all their seeds. I mean, this is something they've developed, and it's been, you know, long a practice, you know, in archaeological methodology that you also have archaeobotanical studies. Well, the Chinese have begun doing this, and the only two seeds of fruits that were found at Jiahu from this period are hawthorn fruit and grape. So, so that's why we decided in the, the drink that we did the recreation of to use both fruits in that. Now, you know, you don't really know, but you know, the fact that the, uh, we first did the chemical analysis pointing to those two fruits, and then the archaeobotanical evidence came along, and it did support that, uh, that either fruit or both could have been used. Um, so for people that are interested in wine, I mean, this is the first usage of a grape, you know, that's pr uh, changed into wine anywhere in the world, going back to 7,000 BC. Um, then you can ask questions about uh, the rice, whether it's domesticated or wild. You can ask the same question about the grape, because the interesting thing about the grape is uh, we have no evidence the Chinese ever domesticated the grape. And, but they had these high sugar wild species that they could have gathered. And so that's a possibility. Now, how did they handle the rice? The rice is not in a form that can be fermentable. It's just carbohydrates. So they have two choices. They, uh, to my mind, they can either uh, sprout it like barley and make a malt, or the other possibility, which I think is more likely, is they chew the rice. And we have enzymes in our saliva, patilin, which will break down the carbohydrate into sugar. And then you can spit this out and uh, maybe add some other fruit that has yeast on it, or you can just sort of wait till you know some wandering yeast somehow gets into it. But uh, the, the real yeast that uh, ferments uh, is not airborne. So, but a, an insect that uh, detects the sweetness of this uh, expirated uh, uh, stuff from your mouth, uh, you know, they'll come to it and they can inoculate it with yeast. So. Um, I, I think that is sort of the primitive method that was used all over the world to break down all kinds of carbohydrates, whether grains or roots or what have you. And uh, even today, like in some islands out in the Pacific or in Taiwan, they have marriage ceremonies in which uh, primarily the women uh, spend the day getting ready for the marriage ceremony by chewing the rice and then spitting it out into a large uh, container and then fermenting it and serving it at the, uh, the marriage ceremony. Uh, now here we've got an example, <laughs> you know, of a, a drinking rice wine, um, and, and you know, taking this extreme beverage and drinking it with straws again. And this is a modern example from southern China. Uh, now we did an experiment ourselves. Now uh, you'll be glad to know that we did not use this method to make Chateau <laughs> Jiao, <laughs> but we did try it on corn, and we did this a couple years ago where we made a chicha corn beer uh, based on the American uh, traditions in which we spent eight hours chewing corn. And the next day, of course, our mouths were completely chafed and our jaws were aching and so forth. Uh, and we put in things like pepperberry and strawberry, which is also uh, attested. Um, and, you know, it did turn out to be a pretty interesting uh, beverage, but... Uh, and, 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 you know, in ancient America, like the Incan Empire, they would just take the most beautiful women and put them in a, a special building where they would do the dyeing of the textiles, but they would also do all the chewing of the corn. So if you were too beautiful, that was your job for life, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I should put it, you know, an added note here that, you know, the, the, the real uh, brewers of antiquity or the real winemakers, uh, fermented beverage makers, uh, were generally women. And we have textual evidence to that effect, and you can still see it traditionally. The men would be out hunting, you know, and they would, when they came back home, the women would, you know, serve up the, the fermented beverage to them. So, you know, women are a really big part of the whole story of, of why we have a lot of these fermented beverages, I think. Um, and we could talk about Jiahu in general. It's a very early Neolithic site that has lots of other fantastic evidence. Uh, including flutes, which uh, are made out of a specific bone, the ulna, of this bird, uh, the red-crowned uh, crane. There's three dozen of these flutes that were found, and they are actually playable. I mean, they're from 7,000 BC. This is the excavator of the site, 
uh, trying to do a, a pentatonic scale, which is the traditional Chinese scale. And it, you can actually produce that traditional scale on a 7,000 BC instrument, and you can play traditional Chinese music on it. And you know, why should that be important? Well, later uh, in Chinese uh, culture, you know, maybe from the Sh Shang Dynasty on, we have pretty good evidence for this, but coming up to the present, uh, music does play a very important role in the whole worship of the ancestors and uh, um, you would have a person that would be assigned as the communicator with the ancestors who was expected to drink seven very large goblets of rice wine. So if you have like a 10% rice wine and you drink very large goblets of, of it, you are put into a, a, a drunken stupor basically. But that was uh, able, then you were able to communicate with the ancestors because the ancestors, <laughs> the ancestors are all drunk too, you know, so. <laughs> so, and then usually at the end of the ceremony, you have some sort of a gong or some sort of music that's played. And, uh, you know, this may already have been occurring back at 7000 BC with this uh, fermented beverage, plus, you know, the musical evidence from the tombs that we have. Um, now, this is the label of Chateau Jiahu, which kind of pushes the envelope a little bit, just like the beverage inside. Uh, this is actually based on a dream of uh, the brewer at Dogfish Head, uh, Sam Calgione, in which um, uh, I won't go into the rest of the details of this dream, but, <laughs> <laughs> but this sign right here is the Chinese uh, pictogram for an alcoholic beverage. It, uh, it shows a jar with three drops coming off the lip, and that indicates beer, wine, any alcoholic beverage. And it happens to be the only Chinese character I really know. <laughs> because if you're in China and you want to get that beer, you know, you just walk down the street, and if you see that symbol, okay, you're all set. You know? <laughs> and of course, it's named after the site of Jiahu. And uh, I mean, it looks like she's drinking champagne, which is, you know, like she's maybe some sort of 1920s, uh, you know, dancer. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's kind of very. So this was uh, Chateau Jahu.